let's hear you guys be bubbly and perky on various topics. Think positive. Positive, positive. positive. Oh, positive. HIV positive. Yes, here's the thing about women with AIDS. We are good. I don't give a damn about my reputation. <laughs> oh, grow up, millennial Velma. Oh. I am over you hot actor types thinking that the world owes you something. You think I'm a hot actor type? I'm auditioning for RuPaul's Drag Race. What the f***? I have a book proposal. I'm gonna stop you right now. But actually, I have more to say. Actually, no, you don't. Pixie stick porn. Oh, oh, oh my god! Okay, you look at all these hot guys and then I give you a tiny shock. Saddest day of my life. Ah! Billy. Maybe we can end this nightmare right now. Stop you, Mazinga! No, Mazinga! Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do not call the cops. Yes, officer. There are five of us. We've all taken ayahuasca. You didn't do a very good job. No, no we really didn't. Did. <laughs> Give it up. Keep clapping for Julie. Bowser. Thank you, guys. Give it up. The rule is you don't stop clapping until they've sat down. So you just, you gotta, just gotta keep No, no, clapping. no, that, you, I'm, I'm sitting. It's okay. okay. You can stop. Okay. Julie, thanks so much Hi, for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Congratulations, season season three. Thank you. Done in the can? Or are you in guys... the can? In the can. When did you guys uh, finish filming it? Uh, around May. We did like two and a half months of production, and then we were editing and finished editing like the Friday before it came out. First, um, first question, kind of a dumb question, kind of an obvious question. What was it like doing a season of this show during? I mean, after this election? Oh, it was during the election. I mean, I'll never forget the day after the election and being in the writer's room and everybody was really depressed and just completely shocked, but as a lot of people were. And we had to change a lot of what we'd already written to accommodate the fact that we were in this sort of new reality. We have this trans truther conspiracy theorist character on the show, Lola, and a lot of the things she says that are supposed to be crazy are, guess what, no longer crazy. Like her conspiracies about Russia and the CIA and gay conversion therapy like it turns out that you know we had to come up with other stuff for her so we tried to acknowledge the election the political climate and take it a step further and in a way justify this terrible world that Billy and Julie live in yeah. um, but at the same time we didn't want to be too heavy-handed you know we're not Sam B we're not John Oliver we're not here to like you know, rip Scaramucci a new one. Um, we're just sort of a fictional show that takes place in this slightly different dystopia. Right. It's 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 much more uh, sort of referential, almost in the background of of what is happening for the uh, for the actual plot lines. Yeah, it's set. just another crappy thing that's getting in Billy and Julie's way. Uh, I mean, in in a way, it's like one of their friends just got cast on SNL. Like that would have been as much of a bummer to them as Trump being elected. <laughs> How, uh, when it comes to Billy and Julie, obviously these are sort of exaggerated versions of probably all of the qualities of yourself that you maybe get bummed out about or sometimes even celebrate. Is that is that what it is? Like, how often do you find yourself writing and go, oh, that's what I would really want to say in this situation? Uh, very frequently. I mean, I love my character because she is... I like to say 40% dumber than me and 200% more confident. And in a lot of ways, she gets to do things that I don't get to do because she turns her hatred outward. And I, as a writer, creator, turn it inward. <laughs> but she blames everything on the, she blames all of her problems on people around her. Um, so that's kind of nice to be able to write in that sort of like arrogant kind of cocksure way. Usually, that is usually the funniest version of ourselves. 40% dumber and 60% more confident. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's, but it's also just like nice to not have to watch a woman hate herself on TV. She can do that in her private life. <laughs> Do you feel like that's a regular trope on television? Watching women hate themselves? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's so many female tropes on television. And, you know, one of the goals of this show is that we always ask ourselves, if you could see this on another show, then we're not going to do it. And if you have seen it on another show, what's the difficult people version of this? How can we put our twist on it? Um, a lot of the stories between me and Arthur, my boyfriend on the show, are 
sitcom stories that you'd see between you know, a husband and a wife, but they're reversed. They're in my point of view. They're not in the male point of view. And he's the one that's very patient. And, you know, why would you do that, Larry, to me, um, instead of vice versa? Now, a lot of the characters on the show and the actors and actresses that, that play them, it's a very diverse show. You have, uh, you have queer people, you have black people, you have white people all over the show. I would honestly say more so than, than, than most things that are on television or streaming. Uh, was that a goal of the show, or was that just sort of a reflection of, you know, the life that you have? Oh, it's absolutely, it was absolutely a goal of the show. I mean, Billy and Julie are outsiders. Whether or not they ever make any headway in their careers, they will always identify as outsiders. Um, ours is a show where outsiders are the main characters. They are visible. Representation matters. It really does. Um, we want to see... We also, you know... In a way, I've been saying that this is the opposite of Handmaid's Tale because on our show, women are thriving and the men are kind of like subservient and submissive. And it's nice to be able to create a world in which that's a possibility where, you know, people of color and LGBTQ people are the story and not the sidekicks or not the, you know, the spice or the flavoring. Um, what's yeah. great about them, sorry, I don't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt your answer. They are also difficult people. You don't make them heroes. You don't make them. They are they are flawed and funny and 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 filled with depth rather than being yeah. like oh we've put this one queer character on here who's going to save the day in this episode. No, you know? I feel like that's an insult to people that can do comedy and want to do comedy. I think there is something political about making you know diverse actors be as difficult and as obnoxious as 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 the leads. I think that you know. I think being funny is sort of the ultimate victory and which is why, you know, especially this season, I was very, very careful to edit Lola um, so that she's always funny like that. Funny's first. You know, we can say what we can we can comment and we do comment on the state of trans people in this country right now. But we aren't preachy, not because we care about being preachy, but because it's more important that people want to see her, that people are excited when she comes on camera because she's funny. Um, and, and, and there is sort of an equality to like everybody on the show is kind of a jerk in his or her own way. And, um, and jerks get to be funny. So why wouldn't we want that privilege? And I think as much as the show isn't preachy, the way that it works is that these people live in New York. They're very tuned into the news no matter what. So like this idea of what it's like for a trans person in, in 2016, 2017 is going to come up in the show, even if it's in a joke. You know, like these people are, whether they're making fun of it or they're actually serious about it, are very attuned to what is kind of happening, even if they're not very smart about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we try to stay as current as possible as to what is happening in the zeitgeist. And we do write the show a little bit before um, there's like a six month gap or so. Um, so we try to be universal. That election definitely threw a wrench into a lot of things. Um, a lot of things. Yeah, no question. Yeah. But most importantly, my show. Um, <laughs> but, um, but Was yeah, every conversation for you just after the election, you were just people like, are like, my show. Yeah, people are like, how's your show? And I'm like, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah. And also just that we are in New York and that everybody in New York is difficult in his or her own way. And that you don't need to really sell the fact that Billy and Julie are struggling if you put them in a, you know, city as chaotic as New York City. You had a uh, uh, Vanessa Williams on the on the show this season, uh, looking good. No kidding. She looked amazing. She's Vanessa Williams. I know, but uh, and uh, she was wonderful. How did, how did you cast her? What made you cast Vanessa Williams? Well, we needed to choose an actress to play um, Matthew's ex-wife. You know, to whom we've referred in the past two seasons. And we wanted her to be stunningly beautiful and we wanted her to be older than him. And beyond that, you know, well, we have this great casting director and he was like, how about Vanessa Williams? And we were just like, oh, my God, if she can do it, that would be absolutely incredible. Nobody doesn't want to watch Cole and Vanessa Williams make out on a mound of food. Um, and she completely went for it. Totally committed. So funny and just a uh, total stunner. Yeah. What was it like shooting that scene with her? Well, I wasn't there because love scenes, you want to like sort of have a closed set. Yeah. So it's very few love people. Scenes. Yeah, there are love <laughs> scenes on the show. There are. There's sexuality on the show. There is. I just like that. That is an well, idea. Well, that was love. love. They made love. It just happened to be on top of a few pies. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, it was pretty much a closed set. It, they did it all in one take. 
um, and they just completely went for it. Wow. Yeah. One of the other things that uh, I, I liked about this season that you covered, and I talked to you about this backstage, was Woody. Uh, you talked about Woody Allen and being an actress getting casted in a Woody Allen movie. Where would you actually stand on that as an actress? Do you know what you would do? Well, it will never happen, and it never will happen. But... <laughs> Is it by your own choice, or you mean you don't think they would ever the, cast... The, 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 I mean, pick pick a card. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it, it ain't happening. Um, but uh, I've, I've aged out of that after I got my GED, you know? Um, I did not get my GED. Not yet. Maybe one day. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it, it was... <laughs> that episode was... Uh, you know, inspired by his Amazon TV show, which is shocking, shocking, shockingly bad. And I can't recommend that you guys all find it and and watch it enough um, because it is, as I mentioned, shocking. Uh, very, very lazy period, but he has no idea how to like write for girls or women. Miley Cyrus is in it. It's insane. So we used to watch that in the room and goof on it. And we did our own sort of tribute slash shop by shop parody of it. You have a, a great, I don't remember the line uh, off the top of my head, but one of the things that you say to the old man in the scene when is, is something along the lines of like, you're so much smarter than me. And I'm like, yeah, do you remember? I'm an, I'm an imbecile, but you're vibrating on a sexual energy. I must be your muse. Which is the subject of every woman in every Woody Allen movie. I mean, Scarlett Johansson falling in love. I mean, it's just... Woo. Whatever yeah. works, which is quite possibly the most infuriating movie I've ever seen. That movie Larry was David shocking. That movie, to me, was more offensive to women than anybody. Kind of, like, that I was surprised didn't inspire a woman against, a women against Woody Allen-style protest. Like, just being able to depict girls like that is just... I don't know. That, I remember seeing that with a girlfriend and then like 15 minutes, like kind of as a goof. And then we were just like, why are we doing this to ourselves? <laughs> I remember being uh, uh, very offended by Larry David's monologues to camera as well. His breaking the fourth wall in that movie. Well, that was written for Zero Mostel in the 70s. Was it really? It was. And Woody put it on a shelf, took it back. Turns out in 2004, wherever, whatever it came out, fresh as a daisy. Not, it hadn't aged, it hadn't aged one bit. So Zero's not available because he's what, dead? Fine, call Larry David. We'll make this picture. He calls them pictures, by the way. How often do you think it's pulling something off the, oh, I gotta work again this year. What do we have here? I rewatched the documentary that his friend uh, Bob Whitey made over the weekend, which is a, can I curse on this show? Yeah, absolutely. Which is a sloppy blowjob of a documentary. I mean, he really, like, he just chokes on it, and there's no, the Sunni thing goes like that. They're like, personal lives, what are you going to do? And then it goes right back to how brilliant Match Point is. Bob Whitey did, actually did a lot of press during the most recent uh, sort of Dylan, controversy yeah. about uh, yeah about about Dylan Farrow. When Dylan accused Woody of having molested her. Woody's friend came to the forefront and said, "No, he didn't," which was very classy, I think. Um, but I, I rewatched that documentary, and yeah, he just has all these scraps of paper. <laughs> I mean, he really is this like curmudgeon who's operating on a you know of technology that is ancient. But um, he just has scraps of paper that he probably scribbled down at the Carlisle or whatever, and it's just like. A guy has a hypnotist who makes him irresistible to women. Eh, I don't like that. And then right. so forth, but yeah. A magician pulls beautiful women out of his hat or something. And they get yeah. younger and younger, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Benjamin Button, but in reverse for girls. No, not in reverse. Anyway. Now, Julie, you are also uh, the head writer and executive producer of Billy on the Street, right? Well, I was. I didn't work on oh. this last season. Oh, okay. Difficult people kept me pretty busy, but I have worked with Billy on that show in the past. What was it like doing both those shows, though, at the same time when you when you did? I didn't really. You didn't? No, no. When Difficult People came along, I, I put all my energies into the show with my name on it and my, my face and so <laughs> forth. I was like, this isn't going to be something I'm going to half-ass. <laughs> yeah, like, unlike Billy enough. before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you when you set out to write the show and you're working with Billy, how closely do you work with him to sort of like create characters or like parts that he wants to do, scenes that he wants to do? Not terribly close. I mean, Billy's really an actor on the show, and obviously, I value his creative contributions enormously because he's one of the funniest human beings alive, and I'd be a fool not to. Um, but it, but his involvement on the show, I mean, he's not a producer on it. He pitches ideas for things that he might want to do, and then me and the writers sort of take it from there. And he'll express concerns on things he thinks don't feel right, but in general, he shows up and fucking kills it. And if we have, if he has pitches or he'll improvise certain things here and there once we have everything on this 
page shot, um, it usually ends up in the cut because he's so funny and brilliant. And then when the two of us have to yell at somebody, we always do everything that's on the page and then the two of us just go for it. Are you very good at yelling at people? Very good at like, yelling at people, yes, very where splendidly. Think, where do you think that comes so. from? Um, uh, 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 how much time do you have? I mean... <laughs> Six minutes of Oh, no, questions. we don't have time. It's like psychoanalysis kind of stuff. <laughs> But no, it's it's fun. It's cathartic. It's like what you said. You get to say things that you know you would never be able to say in real life on on the show. No, I, I love the show. It's so fresh and original and funny. And I think when it first came out, it was on the tail end of a kind of trend of shows about comedy shows about bad people. And I remember when it was coming out, I was like, oh, okay. Well. And then I watched it, and I was like, no, this there is something different and funny and wonderful about this. It doesn't feel like this trend that's been happening that even the major networks tapped into. Were you aware of that trend and trying to find a way to wiggle, wiggle out of it or, or sort of not fit into that at all? Well, I have always been a huge fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and I've and I was a huge fan of Louie, of his show on FX. And I wanted to do something for myself where I got to play a character as imperfect or quote unquote unlikable, even though if you're funny, you're likable. It's always like a, a red herring to say that, you know, oh, they're unlikable people. They're not, they're just morally corrupt. But if they're funny, they're likable. Um, right. It's like Always Sunny are the most morally corrupt people on mm -hmm. television. But People seem to like them. Yeah. Um, or uh, Kenny Powers on He's Bound and Down. Um, I was incredibly inspired by Lisa Kudrow on the comeback. The best show. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I, I, I've I always wanted to have the fun that men do when they get to cast themselves as somebody horrible and get into trouble and have to backpedal and do a foolish job of it. Um, so that was definitely a goal of mine and an influence of mine going into writing the pilot. How do you guys work in the writer's room? Is it like everybody comes in and pitches ideas and then you build storylines around that? Or do you have storylines that, you know, you want to see throughout the season? Both. I mean, we have a couple weeks of Blue Sky, which is just sort of pitching anything at all. Um, Billy and Julie Get a Strike Rat was on that board. Um, thank you. And then... Um, it's me and my showrunner, Scott King, are in the room, and the two of us have this very long, intense, and extended conversation slash argument slash, you know, uh, dictating to our writer's assistant who's typing everything down. Um, and then as we break the story, we have other writers come in and help us and pitch. Um, generally, we've figured out the structure at this point where we know there's a Billy story, a Julie story, a Billy and Julie story, and then either an Arthur runner or a Marilyn runner, and something is going on at the cafe, which is a lot for 25 minutes. But we figured out... Each episode. Yeah. And we figured out, you know, this season, the more economic we can be, the economical we can be, like... In the Strike Rat episode you mentioned, Marilyn's story and Billy's story are the same. So we can kind of get both of their goals out in that in that thread. Um, and then we just keep re-breaking and re-breaking and re-breaking. And I usually pitch jokes because that's what I like to do in the room, sort of. I'm a little better at that than story, I think. And then um, I usually go off and do the first draft. Scott does a couple first drafts and then we just rewrite and then we rewrite on the set too. And then we rewrite in posts and do ADR. And so it's kind of a nonstop writing experience. What's your favorite part of the process? Uh, writing and coming up with, like being in the room with my funny friends and coming up with something or having them come up with something and laughing really hard and then taking a break and watching you know, Woody Allen's show or... Laughing that, really hard. Yeah, exactly. Or Kim Cattrall improvising beat poetry with her husband. Or there's a commercial with Robert Loja for um, Orange Juice that we watch a lot. And yeah, those are... That's, that's the best part of it by far. Do you, do you like acting? I do. I, I think of writing as uh, like wrapping up a present for myself and acting is like being able to open it on Christmas morning because it's fun to be able to, you know... It, it, it's it's more it's play and writing is work and I always say it's the exact opposite where when you write you feel like shit but you feel great after when you act you feel great while you're doing it you feel like total shit after and if you work it out well enough you could feel like shit all the time <laughs> a friend of mine recently said that the best part of writing is finishing no question Absolutely. Everything up until then is a nightmare. Yes, completely. Because you have to be alone in your own head, and writers hate themselves, so it's just a constant loop of, like, the first 30 seconds of adaptation. Yeah, yeah that's just that voiceover over and over again. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a, a question? 
Oh, right there. Welcome hey, to you. Oh, hi. Um, such a huge fan of the show. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, how collaborative was Billy like on the show? Because I know you guys work together on Billy on the Street as well. So yeah. I was just wondering. Like, well, Billy, you know, Billy is not a writer on set um, or a writer on the show necessarily. But like I said, he is... Um, he improvises off of the scripts, and I'd be foolish not to give him the room to do that. Um, but the ideas, like I said, he'll pitch, but we write the show, and then we bring him in as an actor for the most part. Or his pitch is like, he'll throw you an idea in an email or something if something comes to him, and it's yeah. like, it's okay if you use or you don't use. Yeah, you know, absolutely, like, absolutely. Or like, you know, I think it's it's traditional... From my understanding with TV shows to talk to the cast at the beginning of the sh of the you know writing period and say hey is there anything that you think you might want to do this season and you know even if it's something as simple as like I want to dance or <laughs> I want to do more scenes with Andrea or you know things like that so yeah he will pitch but mostly we're the ones who flesh it out and honestly a lot of the times the more ideas the the better if as long as they're they're good and they're usable oh completely at a certain point you run out so yeah and, and I'll always listen to Billy I'll always listen to anything he has to say next question uh hi um hi. my friend Courtney is a really big fan of the show and she wants to know what are your favorite props and costumes from this season Oh, from this season? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely the cigarette girl outfit. That was a lot of fun. Um, uh, the, we've dressed up the dogs like the Blues Brothers, which was absolutely ridiculous, but a dream come true of mine. They kept their hats on, which is wonderful. Um, we have a lot of great props. We had the Fonda 5000 last season, which was the video camera that they use on Grace and Frankie to shoot Jane Fonda, and um, all the electrical circuits go out whenever they use it because it's so high-powered. Um, but uh, we have an amazing prop department. They made that strike rat. They made that strike rat from scratch. So, I mean, who could be luckier than me? Why did they have to make it from scratch? You, from scratch, you can't buy those? You can, but the idea was that it was bespoke, the right. idea that Vanessa Williams had made it. Right. So it, it had to look like a knockoff. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, your hair is so beautiful. Like, thank I you. I keep looking at your hair. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was wondering who makes you laugh the most on set? Um, well, this season it was Chris Elliott. Um, he was a guest star. He's actually on this week's episode. Um, I, I, I mean, Funniest. oh my God, he was so funny. There, there, we have a little blooper reel and 90% of it was just me breaking at anything. He's in between takes he'd be like this is how I'm gonna kill myself like he would just he would say horribly inappropriate things um and then it would be like action um but uh Andrea Martin makes me laugh very hard uh Cole Scola makes me laugh um we're we have a very funny cast we're very lucky uh, I love the show. It's on Hulu. It uh, it streams. Uh, I think every is it every Monday night a new episode goes up. Uh, every, Tuesday, every Tuesday, but night. it comes I out like apologize. Monday at midnight. You you, it's okay. I forgive you. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, the first the first three four episodes are are up right now of this yep. season plus the last two, uh, last two seasons. Last two seasons. Season. Yep. And uh, so guys, tune in Tuesday nights. Tuesday. Mornings, Tuesday, Monday night. anytime you want. That's the beauty of the internet. And I just confused this more. Look, it's on Hulu. Fine, it's, it's on, on Hulu. Hulu. It comes new episodes on Tuesdays. Julie Klausner, everybody. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you.